Hello, everyone, and welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. I got a brand new guest on the line, someone who I've received so many text messages about, uh, connections on Twitter, you know, people saying, hey, check out Michael Oliver's work. He's calling it down to the T on what is going on in precious metals here in 2020. And his work goes back many, many years, 1992, uh, founder and chief analyst of Momentum Structural Analysis, www.olivermsa.com. And uh, we're going to be getting into it. Uh, he has an emphasis on momentum trend structures, and he gives his subscribers reference points to look at. And so he's going to discuss that with us today and, and really uh, explain what he means by momentum trend structures. Unlike how most people use it, uh, he has a proprietary analysis, has, which has been very successful throughout the years. Michael, thank you so much for coming on Crush the Street with me today. Thank you, Kenneth, for inviting me very much. Thank you. Well, I'd like to start off with an introduction, kind of how you got started in this, and obviously what led you to where you are today, doing what you do, and helping people get ahead of these trends and make money in the markets. Well, my background is uh, in 1975, I uh, quit work on a political philosophy degree. <laughs> it was a recession back then, by the way, a big bad one. And uh, a friend of mine had joined Merrill Lynch at the time, the Futures Division, and uh, he said, come on in, the water's fine. And of course, gold was legalized in January 1975. So I applied to EF Hutton's headquarters in New York City. They're no longer in existence, but it was one of the great old brokerage firms. And their International Commodity Division was headquartered in Battery Park, their headquarters. And the guy who headed their Commodity Division was also the chairman of the COMEX, a guy named David Johnston. And again, this is when gold had just been legalized. I joined them in April of 75. And I didn't know anything about technical analysis. Johnston was a good bar chart type technical analyst and he gave me the basic lessons and so forth. And I learned all about the futures market going down to the edge of the pits, the COMEX and so forth. And so I had a great time there for about a year and a half. Anyway, gold was my main reason for switching out political philosophy into futures markets. Why would you do that? Uh, I love gold. I have a libertarian bent and uh, I like uh, real money. And intellectually, I was all behind gold. And uh, so anyway, that's the background there. But uh, so my, our background is futures primarily, but uh, we've analyzed, as you know, uh, everything in the world is now in the futures market. And it was back then too, in the 70s and 80s, the T-bonds came on board and then stock futures came on board. And so now everything pretty much is in the futures markets. We look at both uh, all four asset categories, the precious metals, commodities in general, stock debt markets and foreign exchange, and they all intertwine, they all influence each other. And so we're never myopic just looking at like, what's gold doing today. You know, it's gold is influenced by a lot of things. It influences other things as well. Um, our mode of analysis, it, when it, we say momentum structure, it's the same thing that price chart people think about or look for when they look at a price chart. They look for structures, like let's say a stock has an uptrend line that it's hit three or four times and they can define it clearly. Well, that's a structure. Or uh, let's say it has a floor, that stock keeps coming down to the same price level repeatedly. Well, that's a structure. And when you break those things, the trend sometimes changes. Well, we find that momentum structures are often one more valid in their, when they do break, they really mean business. And two, they usually break change trend before the price action does the same. So usually momentum will lead. And so that's why we emphasize an analysis of momentum structures and how we plot those is quite simple. Yes, we overlay on our price charts a moving average, maybe a three year average, a three month, a 15 day, whatever, whether we look from short term now to long term. But we also then plot the price action, the, the daily high, low and the close in relation to the given short-term moving average we want. Or in the case of long-term analysis, we'll plot monthly bars in relation to, let's say, a 36-month average. I got an example for you, a visual example. Back in 2011, when gold peaked, um, annual momentum uh, peaked and broke down through a very clear structure. Many months before the price action broke down through a structural floor, 
And so momentum gave you a warning. It says, okay, it's no good anymore. And the market started flopping around then, gold did. And a lot of the bulls thought, oh, gold's still good. It's just congesting for another leg up. But momentum said, no, nah, it's over. And sure enough, by uh, early 2013, gold crashed after waffling around for a year or so. Mm. And uh, you can see that on the, the charts I provided, that uh, you know the momentum broke first and then price joined in later. And then the next set of charts is uh, the gold bottom. Uh, again, we're looking at monthly price, which everybody sees, of course. And, uh, and sometimes what everybody sees isn't always correct. Uh, Joe Granville had a saying, if it's obvious, it's obviously wrong. <laughs> uh, Joe Granville was a famous uh, technician back a couple of decades ago. Anyway, Absolutely. If, you look at, if, if you look at the new charts I've got there, that, that's the current gold market. Uh, it starts back in about 2011, 12, it's crashing down. And you can see the price action uh, starting in about 13, 2013, 14, and 15. Instead of crashing, it started the staircase arduously lower. It wasn't falling apart. It was just continuing to uh, lose ground. But during that same time, if you look at the momentum chart below the price chart, you'll see that annual momentum was building a flat structure. Anybody could see it just glancing at the chart. You didn't see that structure on the price chart, but you did on momentum. And sure enough, that little structure that was about two and a half, three years wide on annual momentum, nice little box, he blew up through the top of that in February of 2016. The price of gold then was $1,144. And frankly, that buy signal has never been negated since then. So I know a lot of people would like to be long gold at $1,144. That was our first major buy signal. And then if you look at the momentum chart again, there was another flat zone of action at about 10% over the 36 month average. And when you came soaring through that last summer, the next, this real strong leg in the market occurred. And that's when price really engaged. So price really broke out back in the summer of 2019 as you came up through the high 1300s. Momentum was already on course for the upside. So we now have a harmonious set of charts here where price is now in agreement with momentum and that's where usually things work out and about, you know, as a trend develops, finally price will get in line with its own momentum. But everything we see in gold and have seen over the last couple of years in terms of its long-term momentum, there's nothing negative that has been occurring. We've had a lot of sharp sell-offs. No doubt the gold bulls have panicked and run five times out of this market. But there's nothing on this annual momentum chart that broke anything. It just staircased higher in a nice orderly manner. And at this point, we frankly think gold is now in, in probably going to enter an accelerated advance. Instead of going up at the pace it's been going up at, especially over the last year and a half or so, we think it's going to go up at a speedier rate. Um, Michael, if you don't mind, let me jump in there. Uh, I want to ask you about gold. And, and I think we're going to get into the fundamentals a little bit too as well. But it's just interesting, you know, looking at what we've seen in the past during the 08 crisis, uh, we saw gold bottom out ultimately at $680 and then head to $1,900 in 2011, basically with a trillion dollars of stimulus. And uh, that was in 2020, we had gold bottoming out and we've had like seven times that amount of stimulus between monetary and fiscal policy uh, thrown at the system in a matter of months. Uh, but the same move from the trough to ultimately a peak uh, with just the same move that we saw with only a trillion dollars of stimulus would send gold to $5,000. Uh, I know it's hard to make, you know, price projections and targets, but the fundamental case for gold going up is just so strong. So I'd like to touch on that a little bit with you. Sure. Uh, it, it's never been stronger. In fact, it's, it's our view that this bull market in gold is likely to be its last. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Uh, it's not just gold happening here. There's all kinds of asset categories that are going to have tumultuous moves. A stock market has only begun to fall apart. Uh, there's a lot of deception going on in the stock market. We'll get into that uh, later on. But uh, we're watching um, commodities in general, which are, of course, very depressed, have been depressed for five years. It's very similar to the behavior of what happened in the late 70s when gold, uh, after its bull market 75 peak, it dropped, got cut in half. By 1976, it was down near 100 bucks, and then it turned around and went to 850 by 1980. That was a period of a lot of central bank 
stimulus as well, not quite nothing like what we have today. And that was during a period of, of lackluster wasteland in the stock market. So investors really had very few places to go and they plowed their money into gold and then they plowed it into commodities. And so we got the inflation the central banks wanted that didn't show up in the stock market. A lot of people forget that period of history. I think we're in for that kind of thing again. But this time I think it's gonna end up in a crisis type situation where the, even the central banks will have to ponder upon what they've done over the last uh, 50 years or so, especially the last 30, in terms of policy. Did it really work? Or was it merely a time waster, a postponer of the liquidation of bad assets that they're trying to protect? And I think that will be a political debate as well across the world, not just here. And so I think this gold move, it's, like, it, it's almost like a war event uh, in terms of the financial asset categories, some of which will be going down during this time, some of which will be going up. And investor preferences, I think, are shifting toward allocating those, those flows of capital that the central banks are fabricating and putting them not where they want them to put it, but putting them in commodities and gold. I think that's going to be the, the success story of the next few years. And I don't know where gold might ultimately be in terms of dollar price. Five Michael, now. let's talk about uh, the fundamentals versus what you're seeing in, in some of the, the different sectors on the stock market. Again, I think this all lends itself to why you're bullish on gold. But I mean, for instance, I personally have tenants in homes and in real estate and you know, some apartments not paying their rent while receiving uh, tons of stimulus money and more money than maybe they were receiving while they were working, maybe not working now. Uh, and such a disconnect in, in the world. But this is largely coming to an end on Main Street with PPP running out and the CARES Act and just all of this extra additional money that people who had a job and don't have one anymore are receiving. But then it all seemed to make the stock market feel good, put people at ease, and stocks have rallied ever since. And you talked about this disconnect in fundamentals and the opportunity in gold being so strong uh, because of it. But, you know, touch on this, if you would. Sure. And it, it, yeah, I'll let you go from there. It, what we decided uh, about a month ago was that the distortion in the stock market we're seeing now is largely being led by a very narrow group of leaders. We know who they are. We picked the top three in our view. That's Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon. And we made the case that when we timed their downturn, the market will follow them. They're leaders on the upside and they're leaders on the downside. And even the S&P is distorted heavily by those three indexes, not just the NASDAQ 100, which those three stocks comprise about 25% of the NASDAQ 100. So they're heavily distorting that index. We know that. But even the S&P 500, the three of those, those three stocks are about 15% of the entire index. Uh, so what Amazon, Apple, and, and Microsoft do is creating chart effects in the distorted, the indexes that are heavily weighted by those stocks. But if you flip it over and you look at some key sectors, uh, for instance, we've got some spread charts uh, that I've, I've included here that show the relative performance of, and, and the price action of the bank sector. Uh, just, I'm using the KBE ETF of the bank sector. And if you look at the price chart at the top of the page, my goodness, from the 2009 low, it didn't even get back to the 2005, 2006 highs. That would be equivalent to the S&P not getting back up to 1500 over the last 10 years. Now, then you look at the spread chart below that, and what the spread chart shows is the relative performance of banks to the S&P 500. And of course, they collapsed in 2008 and 9. We all know that, they were the center of the crisis. But if you look at the spread, it never recovered. So in other words, even though the broad market recovered, the relative ranking of the significance of banks as a subsector of financials never got off the floor. And in fact, about a year ago, that spread started making new lows relative to the S&P below the lows of 2009. What was going on there? Some investors need to look at these charts and say, how did this market know that the virus was coming? Of course, that wasn't the issue in these, these charts. There are bigger, broader issues, and we know that. And when you go to the broader financial sector, XLF, it's the same picture. It's not just the banks. And yet, ponder on this. What does the Fed have the back of? 
Well, the stock market, you say. Well, actually, their main interest is in protecting the financial sector, right? Well, mm -hmm. how come it is over the last 10, 11 years of upside that the financial sector has benefited the least of most of the major sectors in the stock market? And it's now in collapse mode on a relative performance basis. And yet it is the chosen pick of Powell to defend the banks. And yet they're not behaving very well. Why not? And why did this misbehavior begin well before the virus? And then there's a couple other sectors as well that aren't Microsoft, Apple, and Amazon. And for example, transports, their relative performance to the S&P 500 is in collapse mode. Why? It didn't just start with the virus, by the way. You can look at the spread chart and see that. On the same page is a spread chart of the XLI, which is the industrial sector ETF. Big industrial names, not Microsoft, Amazon, and Apple. How come that spread has been in collapse mode for the last year? What's going on there? It's not the virus. So I think the virus has in effect masked a lot of what's really going underneath the surface and it's quite simple, I think. You've had 11 or so years of price distortion in the equity markets caused and deliberately caused by the Federal Reserve and ECB and the BOJ. In fact, the BOJ is one of the biggest stockholders in the world. Uh, and Powell now is a, much a defender of these things as well. He's outright buying ETFs of junk, junk bonds and things of that sort. Pretty soon he'll be buying stocks. So we've had a price distortion in the stock market of 11, 12 year bubble in effect, not created by great fundamentals, but created by central bank intentions. And we think that bubble's coming unwound. And so we think when Microsoft, Apple and Amazon break down and we monitor those for our subscribers, uh, when we time that, we think the front end of the market will, the S&P and the NASDAQ will be leaders on the downside, unlike the banks now, which are the leaders on the downside. So this is a crisis event. I think this is probably the biggest crisis I've ever seen in my career. And we've had some, you know, uh, various times, especially the 2008-9 collapse. But this one, I think, is the, uh, the final curtain for the central banks. And I think a lot of people will become aware of that. The wave effects socially, you already mentioned a few of them. Like, you know, when people run out of money, what are they going to do? You know, well, they're going to have to print more. That's what they're going to have to do. Well, when they do that infinitely, it distorts everything, not just the stock market anymore. Right. And uh, it, get, it could get dangerous. Um, politics could lead to such terms as secession, in my view, becoming a household term in 2021. And I'm not predicting which side will secede. You know, Cali from, California from the nation, New York from the nation, because they want to go one way. Or Texas wants to secede because they don't want to go the way New York and California want to go. I wouldn't be shocked if that term comes up during this crisis. Wow. Well, and as it, it, money and politics go hand in hand, uh, whether people want to... Uh, address it or not, not everything surrounding politics has to do with the money sector. But uh, I mean, for the most part, you know, you have to talk politics to a certain degree if you want to know what's going to happen with your money. So um, my goodness, uh, I'd like to touch on what's happening in the miners. I mean, this is something that you've really tracked beautifully uh, with what's going on with the GDX, with the large gold miners. And then what's happening with the GDXJ and just where we are in this bull market for gold, silver, and just the general environment right now. Well, I th we think at MSA that uh, the miners and silver will lead gold at this point going forward in terms of percent upside. In the past several years, since uh, gold made its low in 2015 and had it up and then had an erosion and then a range bound situation, it performed better on a percent basis than did the gold miners which were largely sideways, and silver, which uh, drifted lower, and in fact, made a new low uh, back in March. Uh, we think that's over. We think from this point forward, you can bet, better bet on the gold miners and probably the junior miners. They haven't quite broken out yet versus the GDX. The GDXJ is the junior miners, GDX is the larger miners. The relative performance difference between those two is getting close to a breakout that would favor the juniors, but that hasn't quite happened. We expect it to happen. But in the case of silver, uh, a big event occurred last week, a very big event. For us, we had been plotting for months annual momentum of silver, 
And there were two major rallies in silver over the last couple of years, in 2016 and again last summer. And on a price chart, they didn't stop at the same place. When one went up to $21 and failed, and the other one went up to 19 plus and then collapsed down in March. Well, on an annual momentum chart of silver, those two highs were precisely to the decimal at the same level on our annual momentum charts. In other words, a certain number of points above the 36 month average. So they created what we call a double pop on momentum. Last week, silver blew through that. So silver has broken out of an annual momentum base that goes back actually to 2013. It's a huge base. Price action is, should follow soon. It is today. It's already up 50 cents today, I think. Uh, we think silver probably in this rush over the next month or so could see itself in the upper 20s very rapidly. And now uh, we think ultimately it's going a lot higher. But uh, I'm talking just the first post breakout leg. And uh, so watch for silver now to outperform gold on a percent basis. Uh, as far as the miners go, again, we think the miners will also outperform gold on a percent basis, even though they have not done that over the past five or six years. We think the game's changed. It's now time to emphasize the miners and silver over gold. Though gold is the mama, so we always have to watch the mama. And <laughs> it will mm -hmm. dictate, you know, trend wave direction. But uh, those two overlooked areas, silver and the miners, are now the better place to be. And what are, what's happening with the money, the managed money, the big money? Are we starting to see that uh, them yeah. we uh, think, go into yeah. gold and silver and the miners? Yeah, I, th I think it's gone into gold now. And, you know, a lot of fund managers can't buy gold, obviously, so they can buy miners. So if you'll notice over the last several months, uh, last year even, what's been the strongest in the gold miners? It's been the big name companies, you know, Barrick Gold, Dumont, so forth. Big, you know, large cap gold miners. Why did they fund managers buy that? Because it's a safe thing to do. They could get in trouble with their investors if they put them in little junior miners and it didn't work out. But buying the big blue chip gold miners was the place to be. And I think that was a sign, the behavior of those stocks being strong relative to the juniors, let's say, it was a sign that in fact, fund managers around the world were plowing into the gold market and utilizing the, the front end of that market as their vehicle. We think that's now changing. Probably it's a sign now with the junior miners roaring ahead here that a broader investor class is moving into the, the gold mining sector now, not just fund managers, but individual investors are getting more in tune with it. They've been very fragile over the last five or six years in terms of commitment to that, that sector because those, that sector has flopped up and down. It's actually held sideways, so it really hasn't hurt them. But uh, every time it flinched, they run, <laughs> the average gold investor. And as we've argued since 2016, there's been no reason to get out of gold or related. All the things are positive. You know, one of the things that I know is big for you is uh, investor psychology. And with your momentum analysis, you're not about uh, – trying to trade in and out of these short-term moves, but, but longer-term moves and really be able to participate in a sector. And uh, that could have been the case going into the COVID crisis, the virus here, but, um, you know, with people selling out of their minor positions, but that was not your position, you know? And so maybe touch on that a little bit as it pertains to investor psychology and capturing real gains in these moves. Well, we, we know that a lot of our subscribers are, you know, we, first off, we only accepted institutional subscribers when we started the firm in 92. It was only in 2014 that we opened ourselves up to retail uh, subscribers, uh, high net worth investors or small investors, whatever the case may be. But we didn't cater to investors at the time, only institutional accounts. But we know that uh, they... They are concerned sometimes with short-term in and outs, but the problem with that is any given trend is going to have swings that are counter to the major trend. And if it's a big trend and it generates so 10 or 20 counter trend swings, if you try to dodge and get out of every one of those downturns on the assumption that, my God, this is the end of the bull trend, I've got to run away, you know, et cetera, uh, we try to assess that, okay, this dip is nonsense. Yes, it could hurt, but it's temporary. So back after the summer highs and fall highs in the GDX, the miners, and, and in gold last year, then we had that drop that occurred in March. And that was because the gold investors, especially the smaller investors, thought that they believed the old assumption 
if the stock market goes down, the gold miners will panic with it. Well, they were right, but they helped generate the event. But we argued when TDX dropped back from 30 and traded below 25, we said, uh oh, there's going to be a uh, there's going to be a downside spike here. It could be we don't know where, but it's good. It could be scary. So we did warn that it could be scary, but we also warned that in, in print that if you get out of your position in the GDX or in any miners, you better learn how to get back in very quickly because when this thing turns, it's gonna be a bear trap turn, a V bottom turn. And sure enough, it was. I mean, we were back at 30 within weeks. The GDX was making new multi-year highs within a, a month or so. 32 broke out over all the highs of the last couple of years on GDX, which is now trading over 40. But sure enough, that short-term break was a prime example of the kind of scary events where you have to be able to assess whether is this the real break or not. And our work said, no, it is not. It's a bear trap. And it cleaned a lot of people out of the market, a lot of longs, and it probably sucked a lot of shorts into the market who were immediately killed. That's why we call it a bear trap. So, you got to know when you want to focus on short term or not, but we think this move here is an historic move that's underway and therefore it's really time to treat gold as something different than you've treated it over the last years. And let's touch on the market one more time, circling back and, and maybe just in a roundabout sort of way uh, as we conclude this interview here. The equity markets, you talked about them being very overvalued. Um, but at the same time, with the federal government and the Fed printing tons of money and creating an unsustainable situation, getting out of the dollar is kind of the name of the game. And buying stocks is getting out of the dollar to a large degree. Um, what, what would you say to that reason for getting into overall equities as just a hedge against the dollar? in this environment? Well, I'm not sure the correlation between the dollar and the equity market, tell you the truth. Uh, for instance, even with gold, which normally investors think, well, if the dollar's weak, gold's up. Well, the dollar hasn't been weak over the last two years. The dollar, in fact, is about where it was two years ago. And there were times here in recent months where the dollar was uh, five or six, 7% higher than it is right now. Uh, and yet gold has exploded. So that's a correlation in the past that used to be one that investors tried to correlate and, and think should be the, that way. But if you paid attention to the dollar the last few years, you missed the gold move. And we think some of those same comparisons with the stock market could also be invalid. Uh, the, we think the dollar is going to be in big trouble if it drops about another half a point below where it is right now, by the way. We've got some long-term momentum reasons for that. We deal with it in our reports. Dollar index right now is trading below 96. And our key trigger numbers are monthly closes around 95 and a half. You do that, they mean the what dollar should get washed. Uh, another leg down. But as far as the stock market being buoyed by the Fed, all I can say is this: there have been too many times in the past when the Fed came in to support the stock market and it didn't work. Between 2000 and 2002, when the dot-com bubble broke, they were defending the stock market all the way down. Between 2007 and 2009. Bernanke was defending the stock market all the way down. He had all kinds of interventions. He was accepting less than uh, quality debt at the Federal uh, Reserve window. Uh, mortgage debt, for example, helped destroy that market in the process of what he did. Uh, and it didn't help the stock market. The stock market went from the mid-1500s to 667 on the S&P 500, despite Fed action all the way down. So put that, you know, remember that. Uh, ultimately, the Fed actions, even if they continue, even if they're historic, and they will be, and they are, the investor is ultimately the guy who diverts that river of cash to where he wants it to go. In 2009, when he bought the stock market, he did the right thing. In fact, we were bullish then. The stock market had been washed out, wiped out, and therefore putting the flow of money into the uh, wiped out asset category made some sense. Now, ultimately, it went too far. We know that. But right now, I think the same principle applies to the commodity basket. It got wiped out in 2016 and is laid on the floor ever since. It won't go any lower. It's cheap. It isn't going to zero. And we think commodities are now going to get the benefit largely of the Federal Reserve, ECB, and BOJ efforts. And so the Fed at your back right now, our, our slogan is the Fed has the back of gold. Not that that's their intention, but they have the back of gold. 
So if you want to use that mantra, use it. But the gold is the, is the beneficiary and related. Powerful. Uh, Michael Oliver, everyone. Michael, uh, thank you so much for coming on Crush the Street with me today. If people want to learn more about you, the work you do, how they can uh, reach out to you, please let them uh, know where they can go and what they can expect to find. Well, our website is uh, www.olivermsa, Momentum Structural Analysis, olivermsa.com. And um, ask for sample reports. Uh, There's a lot of information on the site about our history, our methodology, and so forth. So anyway, thank you, Kenneth. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir.